Good evening all, again. Open up your Bibles to Exodus chapter 28. Exodus 28. Now, uh, I, I think that one of the most exciting things that we get to do as believers is we get to serve God. And uh, I, I think that's uh, not only an incredible privilege, but I also think it's a very exciting thing. Uh, but serving God, though, uh, it also means serving Him His way, not our way. Uh, sometimes we want to do stuff and say, okay, well, Lord, this is for you. And, I, you know, sometimes I'm thinking God's in heaven going, I don't want that. <laughs> you know, I, want, I don't want nothing to do with that. You want to serve me, here's the way that I want you to serve me. <laughs> And, and there are certain things that he's going to require from us if, if we want to serve him. Now, in our narrative here in Exodus chapter 28, God is still instructing Moses on Mount Sinai about how God is to be worshipped as an individual and as a nation, as a people, my people. This is how I want you to worship me. And now he's uh, moving on and instructing Moses for, for those that I'm going to call specifically to serve me in, I guess, what we would now call the ministry, to serve as priests uh, within his, his body or within the nation of Israel. This is how I want you to do it. And so, um, uh, as God designed, some would serve him, and, and again, we're talking about Israel as a nation, ancient Israel, some would serve him, uh, directly in the tabernacle or around the tabernacle, and some would not. There would be roles and responsibilities uh, for everyone, and everyone had to be clear on what those roles and responsibilities were. Not everybody gets to do everything. I think that's one of the mistakes that we make sometimes in the church here in the 21st century is we think everybody can do everything, and, and that's not necessarily true. There are roles and responsibilities as God designates. And uh, the interesting thing, although God does not deal with the church the way that he dealt with his people Israel in ancient times, sometimes I kind of wish that he would, um, and that is it, 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 at this time period, if you were not clear on your roles and responsibilities, it could cost you your life. You, you could die if you did God's stuff the wrong way. And... Uh, you know, it would certainly keep a few of us out of the pulpit on Sunday mornings if that's what we faced every week. You know, you either preach God's word God's way or he's going to kill you. Maybe, you know, I would stick to, you know, cutting hair and, and not, not doing this pastor thing. Now, the, the point of, uh, of Exodus chapter 28, this is how the priests are going to be dressed. Uh, I mentioned that last week. What are, what are all the priests going to be wearing this year? Uh, well, we're, we're going to find out. Uh, what they're going to be wearing. Uh, the, the outfit that they wear uh, was to serve as symbolic reminders of things uh, that were vital to remember. Uh, you obviously know that we're, you know, we don't wear vestments here in the church. Some of us were raised in churches where uh, the, the pastors, even in Protestant churches, the pastors might wear a robe or something like that in the pulpit or a sash. Uh, and, and for those of us in what we call low church, uh, you'd be lucky to get a necktie out of me. And and then those in in high church, uh, then they wear all the all the vestments. And and for me, sometimes all the vestments they kind of end up looking just a little bit silly. I know they're supposed to be symbolic of certain things, but I just wonder sometimes if the things that they're symbolic of aren't just kind of missing the point just a little bit. I think we're going to discover some of that here this evening. Uh, God wanted everyone to be clear on these things, so God was going to give his people Israel some visible reminders of the things that were important to him. And this is vital, because when we look at the symbolism of things like the tabernacle and ultimately later on the temple or how the priests are going to be dressed or the sacrifices, we keep looking at these things going, well, well I don't get it. Well, I don't understand why. Okay, well, maybe what we need to think is, these are things that are important to God. 
And if they're important to God, then they need to be important to us whether we really grasp them or not. In, in our case, as 21st century Christians, we get to look at the symbolism of these things. We get to look at, uh, at what they are a shadow of as we get to experience the reality of the things that they foreshadow. So let's, let's pay close attention to what we're getting into here. So Exodus chapter 28, verses 1 to 4 now. Take Aaron your brother, this is God talking to Moses, now take Aaron your brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel that he may minister to me as priest, Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother for glory and for beauty. So you shall speak to all who are gifted artisans whom I have filled with my spirit of wisdom that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may be, or that he may minister to me as priest. And these things are the garments which which they shall make, a breastplate, an (coughs) ephod, a robe, a skillfully woven tunic, a turban, and a sash. So they shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, and his sons, that they may minister to me as priest. Now, first of all here, Um, we need to clear our minds of our modern concept of what a priest is, okay? Especially if you've been brought up in in the Roman Catholic tradition, you pretty much need to try your best to wipe your mind clean and get a clean slate here as we approach the topic of a priest and how they are to dress because uh, as we're discussing the priest and as God's designating what a priest is supposed to be, it is not in any way, shape, or form the priesthood as we understand it today. So let's let's try our best. I know those are this is a big thing to ask you, but to try to clear your mind of your your ideas or notions of what a priest is or or how that's been uh, drummed into you from perhaps from birth. Uh, and here, first of all, God designates those who will serve as priest. Now. God starts with Aaron and his four sons. Ultimately, there's going to be multiple divisions of priests, and they were all to be uh, from the tribe of Levi. Remember, Jacob, uh, the father of the nation of Israel, had 12 sons. Those 12 sons make up 12 tribes. So every Jew that exists, both then and now, is one of those 12 tribes. And God had designated the one tribe of Levi that's going to be the priestly tribe. Their work is going to be to minister to me as priests, both what you might call as common priests, but also as the high priest. So there will be different uh, roles and responsibilities within the priesthood. Some are priests that will work in the outer courts. Some are priests that may work on the inside of the tabernacle and ultimately the temple. And then, of course, the high priest, the head priest, who would only go into the Holy of Holies once a year all by himself. So uh, one entire tribe of Israel, their sole purpose was to serve in what we might call common ways. And, and they would do things, not only manage the sacrifices uh, and things like that that people would bring to the tabernacle, but they also had the responsibility of taking down the tabernacle, packing it up, and then moving it, and then setting the whole thing up again whenever God would move. Uh, we'll get to that again later on. So... Uh, there, there's priests that do a little bit of everything. So, you know, you could look at one guy and he, he's a priest, but his job is to set up the outer courtyard. That's what he does. He sets up the outer courtyard. So he's carrying boards and he's got curtains and he's setting that whole thing up. And you think, okay, well, he's supposed to be a priest. Isn't he supposed to be doing some priestly thing? Well, that was a priestly thing. It was a priestly thing to do manual labor as unto the Lord and to minister to the Lord doing that. All priests were to come from the tribe of Levi. You can read about that in Numbers chapter 3 and 4 if you want a little bit more on that. Now, what's interesting here is that God calls Aaron by name. Aaron and his sons. Uh, And and that in itself is interesting on a lot of different levels, which we'll get to here in the upcoming chapters, primarily concerning uh, what was Aaron doing at this moment that Moses was on top of the mountain receiving these instructions. What was Aaron doing while Moses was up there receiving these instructions? We'll get to that in a few weeks. You biblically literate congregation that you are, you know what's coming. So um, that's really, really interesting. Uh, In Hebrews chapter 5 verse 4 concerning this priesthood, 
Uh, the writer of the book of Hebrews says, no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. Aaron is singled out by name to be a priest. Now, today, whatever your religious uh, discipline or background might happen to be, Catholic or Protestant, uh, whatever it may be, there's an awful lot of people in the pulpit, and you probably know this, if not intellectually, you know it intuitively, there's a lot of people in the pulpit that really don't belong there. Uh, they have taken up the mantle of religious service because they wanted to, uh, because they saw some thing in it that attracted them, or, or there was a, they had a romantic view of what the ministry might be, as opposed to someone who is singled out by God by name called specifically to be in the ministry. I always liked what Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said about the ministry. Whenever someone came to him and said, you know, I think, I think God's calling me into the ministry, the first thing he did was try the best that he could to talk them out of it. And he figured if he could talk them out of it, they weren't really called to go into it. And I would agree with that wholeheartedly. Uh, I, I can tell you honestly from my perspective whether whether you think I'm called or not, that's up to you. I, I kind of think that I am, and, and the reason why I am is because I fought against it for so long. And, I, you know, I could have been a pastor much, much sooner than what I was, I guess. I don't know what, what God's plan was for that. But I, I fought it all along, and I really didn't want to be uh, a pastor. And, you know, you know, God just changed my heart about it over time and dragged me kicking and screaming into into the ministry and, and you know, and now I wouldn't want to be anywhere else, you know. But, but we, we hope, we pray that for everyone that stands in the pulpit and assumes that responsibility uh, that they also have a very clear sense that it was God that called them to that position. Not just them, but God called them to that position. Now, Here's an interesting note, too. What were the priests to do? What was kind of their, um, I guess, the, the top of their job description? What y y You might think to yourself, uh, knowing what you know about the, the priesthood and, and, and the Bible, and you might think, okay, well, you know, their number one responsibility was uh, to manage the sacrifices. Sacrifices all day, every day. Uh, their number one responsibility was to tend to the things of the tabernacle. They had the, the lampstand, they had the showbread, they had the incense, which we haven't gotten to yet. Uh, they, there's lots of different things that they had to attend to. Um, but God makes clear what their number one responsibility is to be. And he mentions it twice, once in verse 3 and once in verse 4. That he may minister to me, God says. So the first responsibility of the priest was to minister to the Lord himself. That phrase is used eight times in the book of Exodus to describe what the priests were do, to do. They were to minister to the Lord. Now I find that fascinating because if you were to talk to people that are in the ministry, whether they're Catholic or whether they're Protestant, whatever background there might be, if you were to ask them why they went into the ministry, I'd be willing to bet that, that you might not get that answer from any of them. Uh, you might not even get that answer from me <laughs> if you were to ask me that. But there it is, the number one responsibility of the priest, that he may minister to me, God says. And I find that kind of fascinating. But it's an important reminder for you and for me. And that is all service, whoever it is that we're going to serve. And we start, of course, by serving right here in the church. We serve one another. That's where all service begins. If we're going to serve anybody out there, you got to start by serving in here. And, and all service to anybody, to God's people or outside of here, it begins with service to God himself. And it's in a way, it's easy to serve each other because I can see you and I, can, I, I know what your needs are if I care or if I'm you know, interested, I can find out what your needs are. But what, what needs does God have? <laughs> You know, you know, you can't make him a sandwich. You know, <laughs> he doesn't. He doesn't need an extra pair of pants or something. You know, I mean, what is, so what do you do to minister to the Lord? And we could probably come up um, with a variety of different ideas on what that means. 
But here's a, here is a thought for you that that all service, all service, however it is that we serve, if it's not first and foremost for the Lord and for His own sake, no other reason, just simply because He is who He is, if we don't serve in that sense, God Himself for His own sake, then our service quickly becomes idolatry. Then it becomes something that we do perhaps to soothe or, or ease our conscience or to make ourselves feel better or more spiritual. I think a lot of people serve in different capacities, do a generous or kind things or charitable things simply because it makes them feel good to do it. That's idolatry. <laughs> Pure and simple. That's idolatry. I've turned my service into something that makes me feel better. It's for me. It's not for anybody else. Oh, yeah, yeah, you know, I gave this, you know, homeless guy a sandwich, you know, and I sure felt better about it. Well, well, that's, that's great and everything, but, you know, if you really want to feel that good, take him home, you know, <laughs> give him a job, you know, give him a shower, you know, I mean, seriously, if, if that's going to be, if that's going to be your measure of what makes you feel good, then make yourself feel really good <laughs> and do something serious, you know. When, when we serve God, we serve God, we minister to God, First and foremost, of course, by believing in him, by believing in Jesus, whom he sent to reconcile us to himself. Go back and listen to Rich's message from this past Sunday. To reconcile us to himself so that we could know him and live in relationship to him. That's uh, got to be. That has to be the first step in ministering to the Lord. And then beyond that, it would be worshiping him supremely. Making God first and foremost in and above and over anything and everything and all things. So that God is supreme in, in everything in my life. And then we serve him selflessly, walking in obedience humbly. We just simply be the people that God wants us to be. And that ministers to him. For those of you that have kids... Uh, and I don't have any kids, which of course makes me an expert in them. Uh, but for those of you that have kids, have your kids ever done anything that made you proud of them? Have your kids ever done anything? So some of you are going, no. Uh, <laughs> have you? Have you? <laughs> have you? I won't get into that now. But have your kids ever done anything um, that that was the right thing to do? And you looked at him and you thought, that was cool. You know, I didn't have to yell at him. I didn't have to tell him what to do. They just, they did the right thing. It's almost like they've been listening to me all of these years. They did the right thing. They did a good thing. And you're proud of them for it. It blesses you. Well, how do you think God feels when his kids make him supreme, penultimate in their life? over and above everything, the object of all of our worship and, and our affection. And, and when we do all of that, friends, you know, we're, we're not making God into a supreme egotist, you know, that, that needs us to tell him how great he is. That's not it. That's not what worship is about. Worship is about existing in a right relationship with the God that made us. That's what worship is about. It's not about singing songs or not singing songs. It's about existing in a right relationship with God. And when we do, then we will be the people that he has made us to be. It's to our benefit to do it. Not to his. He doesn't need us to do anything. But it's to our benefit to live in that right relationship with him. And so we do. And it blesses him when we do. Those are my kids. Look at my kids obeying me doing what is the right thing to do, representing me right to the world, loving each other the way that they're supposed to love each other, serving me the way that they're supposed to. It blesses God's heart for us to do that, like the heart of, of any parent. Ministry to people for their own sake will quickly descend into burnout or worse. It'll turn into resentfulness. Because people are thankless, aren't they? <laughs> 
you know, we, we, we make them a sandwich, you know. They're like, oh, that's all you got? You know, get a, the, you, you got no mayo? That's the bologna? That's it? Bologna is all I get? You know, and, and you know what? That happens. That happens. You do nice things for people and you get no thanks whatsoever, but what are you doing it for? Are you doing it for their thanks? Because if you're doing it for their thanks, brothers, sisters, you are going to burn out quick. Or worse, you're going to become resentful of it. Well, I served and all I got for it was just a nothing at all. I didn't even get an attaboy for that. Not even a pat on the back. That's the last time I ever do that. Well, that's what you're doing it for. I'll, I'll never forget the very first time I ever uh, played on a worship team at church. Uh, I was playing drums. I was down at Harvard's Christian Fellowship. And uh, to be on that stage in front of, you know, at the time, uh, it, was a, it was much smaller than it is now. So I was only in front of, I think, about 2,500 people. Uh, it's much larger now. <laughs> they see, I don't know if they see, like, close to 4,000 down there now. And uh, I got up there, and, you know, we had this huge band and all these singers, and we'd worked really hard on all these arrangements and did some really fun stuff, and, and we played, and it was beautiful, and it was awesome, and it was such a big sound and such a big room. And, and I got done, and I was walking up the aisle after everything was, was done, and uh, not one single person came up to me and said, hey, that sounded good. Not one single person I thought, well, <laughs> thank you very much. You know, we, we worked hard on putting that all together, and I didn't, even get a, I didn't even get a, hey, good job. I didn't even get one of those. And boy, I'm telling you, the Lord stopped me dead in my tracks. <laughs> and it was simple. He just said, who are you doing this for? And I said, okay, I get it. <laughs> I didn't get it, and then I got it. I need to do it for him. It's my experience that you're going to burn out serving people, but I don't think you're ever going to burn out serving the Lord. Because I don't think God really burns out his servants. Serving God's too exciting. There's too much going on. It's too... I hesitate to use the word fun, but sometimes it is. Serving God's always going to be an adventure. But God also wants to make uh, another distinction here. We're making distinctions in, in attitude here. Um, God wants to make a distinction with his priesthood here in ancient Israel in the way that his servants would dress. He wanted there to be an outward or a visible representation of certain things. Now you notice that in verse 2. You shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother. Now it's interesting to note that God explains the purpose for the vestments uh, that they are to wear while they are ministering to him. The purpose of the vestments is, is, is right there in verse 2, for glory and for beauty. Now, in, in the New International Version, it says for dignity and honor. Now, I like that. God wants to single out some guys from the, the greater body of believers in, in Israel and says, I want these guys to look different than everybody else when they serve me. And the reason why, they want them to look different for glory and for beauty. It's interesting, even in the New Testament, we pick up echoes of this when the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, when he says, let elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor. God wants to honor those that serve him in certain capacities. Same thing over in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. A similar thing um, when God says in his words, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would not be profitable for you. Now, I, I can tell you, I've had the opportunity to serve under some really great pastors. And I can also tell you honestly, 
uh, I have been a grief to every single one of them at one point or the other. Uh, whether it's just a bad attitude or just me uh, wanting to get my way and I figured I was going to take advantage of the fact that I knew the pastor so I was going to go up and I was going to tell him, hey, you know, this is what I'm going to do and, you know, and, and, you know, and in retrospect, I, I can tell you every single time I confronted one of my pastors, every single time I did it, in retrospect, I was wrong. Uh, at the time, I didn't think that I was. And I'm not saying to you that you can't confront me and that you're going automatically wrong if you do. I'm not saying that. Uh, you can. It's okay. Um, but there's something about wanting to make the job a joy for those that are in positions of authority within the church. And, I, you know, I, I've learned that over the years, and I probably learned that because I've been a pastor for a while. And, and I can tell you that the, the people of this church make it a joy to serve here. I always love coming here. Uh, I'm always anxious to get here. I, I like to get here early, and I, and I just love to see everybody come in, and I love to talk with you guys, and I love to pray with you, and I love to teach you. I love to uh, learn from you, and, uh, and I, it's a joy for me to do so. Now, maybe you don't get up in the morning and you think, you know what, let's go make it a joy for Brian to preach today. Let's, you're probably not thinking that. That's okay, but you do anyways. Uh, because you come and you put up with me and you listen to me. You even occasionally laugh at my stupid jokes. And, and that's encouraging for me when I stand up here. And so you guys, you, you really do make it a joy for that. So though, though I, I may not necessarily be dignified, <laughs> I may not be glorious and I may not be beautiful, um, yet you honor me by coming here to this church and as I like to tell people I'm, I'm always stunned and amazed that anyone anyone at all would come here and listen to me talk I just think that's amazing so while I may not be wearing vestments that 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 um, uh, give me glory and beauty the glory and beauty that I derive comes from you being here and listening and and not only listening but even taking seriously the things that I say and I think that's a, an amazing thing in ancient Israel God wanted to designate certain things that the priesthood would wear so that when people looked at them they would recognize he's a priest and and the the outfit that he's wearing particularly the the outfit of the high priest which we're going to talk about tonight um, it was glorious and it was beautiful in, in its own way, in its own time. We look at it now and we think, well, gee, that's kind of, kind of funky stuff. But at the time, you know, this was serious stuff and, and seriously beautiful stuff. Uh, serving God's an honor. And, and we, uh, as God's people, we don't wear vestments. Uh, we don't need to wear vestments because for, for those of us that are born again by the Spirit of God, we are now, as Scripture says, clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. Amen. And there's nothing more glorious or beautiful than the righteousness of Jesus. He puts that on us. He imputes that to our account. You can read about that in Romans 13, 14, Philippians chapter 3, verse 9. We put on Jesus. And Jesus is always glorious and beautiful. And he is always invested with dignity and with honor. The high priest at this time was to wear seven different items while ministering to the Lord. They're listed here. They are a breastplate, an ephod, a robe, a tunic, a turban, and a sash. And even in verse 42 and 43, underwear. So uh, all were to be skillfully made by artisans that had been chosen by God, as he noted there in verse 3. Okay, pick it up in verse 5. Uh, verse 5 down to verse 14. They shall take the gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread and the fine linen, and they shall make the ephod of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine woven linen artistically worked. It shall have two shoulder straps joined at the two edges, and so it shall be joined together. And the intricately woven band of the ephod which is on it shall be of the same workmanship made of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine woven linen. Then you shall take two onyx stones 
and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel, six of their names on one stone and six, of, uh, six names on the other stone in the order of their birth with the work of an engraver in stone. Like the engraving of a signet, you shall engrave the two stones with the names of the sons of Israel. You shall set them in settings of gold. And you shall put the two stones on the shoulders of the ephod as memorial stones for the sons of Israel. So Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders as a memorial. You shall also make settings of gold and you shall make two chains of pure gold like braided cords and fasten the braided chains to the settings. Okay, so we're starting off here with an ephod. Now, I've got a variety of different images to show you tonight. Uh, and those of you who are just listening, uh, use your imagination. Uh, actually, I Googled all of these things. It's amazing what you can find if you just Google something. Uh, so we've got a variety of images that really show not just the individual items, but kind of what the high priest may have looked like. Now again, all of these renderings, they're just artistic renderings. Maybe it looked like this, maybe it didn't look like this at all. But it's the idea taken from the text as to what different garments were supposed to roughly be. So, uh, Kurt, let's start off with, uh, uh, there's an image just called garments. Just garments. Yeah, there you go. So, here's, here's the idea. Uh, you've got uh, a priest there dressed in all of these layers of different things. And you can see down there on the lower left, the ephod mentioned there in Exodus chapter 28. Uh, along with a variety of other things which we're going to get to. Kurt, how about garments one? Garments number one. There's another rendering of possibly what those look like. I think some of these images come from the Temple Institute in Israel, uh, who's reconstructed a lot of these things already. How about garments two? Garments two, there's another kind of a back shot right there. Um, the ephod is described here as a linen garment made front and back and joined together on the high priest with straps at the shoulders. It's possibly or probably ankle length. Uh, we can go back to just the garments image, Kurt, if you don't mind. <coughs> and uh, it, was, it was possibly or probably ankle length on the shoulders uh, was to be the onyx stones. And if you will bring up garments number six, Garments number six, I think we got a shot of that on the shoulders right there, or garments seven. Same idea on the shoulder. You have onyx stones, and those would be engraved with the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. This was Aaron's reminder here that he was to minister to God first, but also to represent the people of God to God. Because remember, his role at this point was the intermediary between God and the people. Now we know as believers today that Jesus is and was our intermediary who opened the way for us to have direct access to God. At this time, people didn't. You did not have direct access to God like we enjoy right now. It was through the priest. So the priest had to be reminded, and these stones were a part of that, that when he went in to minister to the Lord in the Holy of Holies once a year, that he was representing the people to God and representing God to the people. These stones were to be set in gold with gold chains. Uh, and it's interesting to note, too, that uh, when David was bringing the uh, Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 7, that he wore what's described in uh, 1 Samuel 37 and 8 as a linen ephod as he danced before the Lord and brought the Ark of the Covenant into the city. And uh, uh, that's in 2 uh, Samuel chapter 6, verse 14. Oh, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 7 and 8, David put on a linen ephod to consult the Lord at that time. So there was something about wearing this ephod uh, that represented this ministry to and for the Lord. So there's the ephod. Okay, Exodus chapter 28, verse 15. This is 15 down to verse uh, 30. Uh, you shall make the breastplate of judgment artistically 
woven according to the workmanship of the ephod, you shall make it. Of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen, you shall make it. It shall be doubled into a square. A span shall be its length, and a span shall be its width. You get the idea. It's a square. And you shall put settings of stones in it, four rows of stones. The first row shall be a sardius, a topaz, and an emerald. This shall be the first row. The second row shall be a turquoise, a sapphire, and a diamond. The third row, a jacinth, an agate, and an amethyst. And the fourth row, a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. They shall be set in gold settings. And the stones shall have the names of the sons of Israel, twelve according to their names, like the engravings of the signet, each one with its own name. They shall be according to the twelve tribes. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Didn't we just put those on the shoulders? Now he's putting them on the breastplate. You shall make chains for the breastplate at the end like braided cords of pure gold. And you shall make two rings of gold for the breastplate and put the two rings on the two ends of the breastplate. Then you shall put the two uh, braided chains of gold in the two rings which are at the ends of the breastplate and the other two ends of the two braided chains you shall fasten to the two settings and put them on the shoulder straps of the ephod in the front. You shall make two rings of gold, put them on the two ends of the breastplate, on the edge of it, which is on the inner side of the ephod, and two other rings of gold you shall make and put them on the two shoulder straps underneath the ephod towards the front, right at the seam above the intricately woven band of the ephod. You think God has an idea for detail here? Do you think God is being very, very specific about what he wants? He still is the, to this day. God's very, very specific, but he wants from us how we are to approach him and how we are not to approach him. Verse 28, uh, they shall bind the breastplate by means of the rings to the rings of the ephod using the blue cord so that it is above the intricately woven band of the ephod so that the breastplate does not come loose from the ephod. It's, gonna, it's gotta fit tight on the chest. So Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel over or on the breastplate of judgment over his heart when he goes into the holy place as a memorial before the Lord continually. And he shall put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be over Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. So Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel over his heart before the Lord continually. Okay, the breastplate. A uh, Kurt, uh, the images are uh, garments number eight. Garments number eight. There's a shot of the breastplate or an artist's rendering of the breastplate. Uh, garments number four. This is a little bit closer shot. It's woven and then it's got the stone set in it. And uh, garments five. Another shot or another idea of this breastplate. There were, the, of course, 12 rows, uh, twelve stones in four rows. Each set in the breastplate was to be engraved with the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. The plate was attached by chains and clasps at the corners, as you can see. Uh, it's interesting, in verse 29 and 30, this is referred to as the breastplate of judgment. Uh, let's note here that when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies, uh, he would bear the names of Israel on his shoulders and over his heart. Both on his shoulders and over his heart. Um, this is kind of interesting to me. And I'll just give this to you for whatever it may be worth to you. Um, if you don't love God and love his people, and if you're not willing to bear their burdens with them, then you are not called to the ministry of God. If you don't love God's people, names of God's people over your heart, if you're not willing to bear their burdens with them, the names of God's people on your shoulders, then you are just not called to the ministry. And I would even say, go so far as to say that if you don't love God and if you don't love his people and if you're not willing to bear their burdens with them, I think you should question whether you're saved or not. I think it's, it's that serious, and I think that God's word is really clear about that. Uh, Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. Um, just something to think about. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So if we're not fulfilling that, if we're, if we're not bearing one another's burdens, then we're not fulfilling the law of Christ. I think it's fascinating he puts it in those terms. Philippians chapter 1, verse 7. Where God's word says, um, uh, 
Paul's writing of the church in Philippi, and he says, just as is right uh, for me to think uh, this of you all, because I have you in my heart. The Apostle Paul says, people talk about the Apostle Paul being, you know, stuffy and intellectual and cold, and it's like, not the Apostle Paul I know. So the church of Philippi, he says, I've, I've got you in my heart. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Yeah. God talking about his son. He says, he made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus bears our judgment before God. So we got to love God's people. we got to bear their burdens with them because Jesus bore our judgment before God. Remember, he, he refers to this here in Exodus 28 as the breastplate of judgment. He has to bear this judgment, the judgment of the people before God. Jesus bore our judgment. He, jo he bore our judgment before God that when we stand before God in that day, that we stand there justified, justified, that's a great word. You sang that song on Sunday. Justified, uh, where God makes you just as if you had never sinned. Can't wrap your mind around that, can you? <laughs> Neither can I. Uh, because we just can't imagine it. And yet, th that is what God has done for us. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, the same thing. Now, included in the breastplate was a pocket. The, the breastplate was woven fabric, doubled over, and then the stones were set into it, as you could tell by some of the images. Go back to, like, a garments four. Yeah, you see it's a woven pattern. It's folded over, so there's actually a pocket behind it. In, the, in that pocket, you would put the, these two other stones called the Urim and the Thummim. Now, that is fascinating stuff. And what makes the Urim and the Thummim so fascinating is we don't know what they're for. Uh, there, there have been other religions that have tried to co-op the Urim and the Thummim, that they think that they know what it's supposed to be, the Mormons most famously. Uh, but there, there are two stones that were to be carried in that pocket behind the breastplate. And Ezra chapter 6 verse 23 suggests that these stones were a way of determining God's will on a given subject. Now. We've got nothing else in Scripture on it. There's only that mention there in Ezra chapter 2, uh, verse 63. I think that's correct, Ezra 2, 63. Bottom line is we don't know, so we've got to leave it alone. And we don't know, so we've got to take a pass on that. But there were these two stones referred to by this name, the Urim and the Thummim, that fit into this pocket uh, behind. I, I find that fascinating. But again, along with these stones and the names on the stones, those are reminders uh, with, of the idea that the high priest, as, they, as the high priest would go in and meet with God once a year, that he was to bear the responsibility of judgment upon the people, judgment upon himself, and represent Israel to God and God to Israel. Jesus bears that same judgment for us. Again, 2 Corinthians 5.21 or 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, that he is the propitiation for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. So there's the breastplate. Exodus chapter 28, picking up in verse 31, reading down to verse 43. You shall make the robe of the ephod all of blue. There shall be an opening for his head in the middle of it. It shall have a woven binding all around its opening, like the opening in a coat of mail, so that it does not tear. And upon the hem you shall make pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet, all around its hem, and bells of gold between them all around. A golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate upon the hem of the rope all around. Sounds pretty, doesn't it? And it shall be upon Aaron when he ministers, and its sound will be heard when he goes into the holy place before the Lord, and when he comes out, that he may not die. You shall also make plate of pure gold and engrave on it like the engraving of a signet holiness to the Lord and he shall put it on a blue cord then it may be on the turban it should be on the front of the turban so it shall be on Aaron's forehead that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things which the children of Israel hallow in all their holy gifts and it shall always be on his forehead that they may be accepted before the Lord 
You shall skillfully weave the tunic of fine linen thread. You shall make the turban of fine linen. You shall make the sash of woven work. For Aaron's sons, you shall make tunics. And you shall make uh, sashes for them. And you shall make hats for them for glory and beauty. There that is again. So you shall put them on Aaron, his, uh, your brother, and his sons with you or with him. Uh, you shall anoint them, consecrate them, and sanctify them that they may minister to me as priests. There that is again. And you shall make for them linen trousers to cover their nakedness. They shall reach from the waist to the thigh. Apparently God's a boxer man. Didn't know that. Uh, and they shall be on Aaron and on his sons when they come into the tabernacle of meeting. And when they come near the altar to minister in the holy place, that they do not incur, incur iniquity and die. It shall be a statute forever to him and his descendants after him. Isn't it a great church where you get to discuss underwear from the pulpit? I love Calvary Chapel. Okay, so here in this remaining portion of the chapter, we have the robe, verses 31 to 35, uh, the turban, and again, we need to be careful of our preconceived ideas of what a turban is. That's just the way the word is translated here. It doesn't necessarily mean a turban as we understand it, but it is a headdress of some sort. So it's a turban with this plate, this gold plate on the front, uh, tied on there that says holiness to the Lord. Uh, there's the sash, that's in verses 39 and verse 40. There's the tunic, verse 40. There's the trousers or the undies in verse 42. Uh, again, let's come back to the image that just is called garments. And that's kind of that master photo that gives you the idea of potentially what it could all look like when you put the whole thing together. And again, it's just an artist rendering. Uh, you know, you don't have to take that seriously. That's not gospel. Uh, but it's a pretty good, it's a pretty good rendering uh, of what it might potentially be when you, when you put it all together here. Interesting to note, of course, uh, the use of the bells around the hem of the robe. Uh, Kurt, garments image number nine. Garment image number nine. You can see there at the bottom of the blue uh, robe there, there there's that hem down around the bottom, a, a pomegranate and a, and a gold bell. Uh, interesting to note there that um, the thought there, is, as it says here in, in verse, uh, uh, verse 35, and it shall be upon Aaron when he ministers, and a sound will be heard when he goes into the holy place before the Lord. So uh, nobody could go into the holy place except the high priest once a year. That was it. So the other priests could stay out in the holy place, not the most holy place, the holy place, which is the, the kind of that outer chamber that had the lampstand and the table of showbread and the altar of incense. Uh, and then, of course, you're, you're outside the tabernacle after that. And the guys that were inside would hear the bells tingling around the bottom of his garment uh, while he was in there ministering to the Lord. The, the idea there is that, uh, you know, Aaron's not just standing still in there, that there's some movement in there. Now, if... In fact, they didn't hear the bells jingling in there. Uh, you would have to assume on the basis of verse 35 that he did something wrong. He hadn't done things in order. He hadn't done it right, and God struck him dead. If you don't hear the bells, he's dead. As long as you hear the bells, he's a... He's a that's, that's, that's legendary. It's legendary. Not scriptural, but it's legendary. Uh, but that's an interesting point. Uh, the turban, again, although not necessarily like a turban we could imagine, was to have this gold plate on the front that said, Holiness to the Lord. Now, the idea here, because it goes on to say, I should put it on the blue cord, uh, with the blue cord, uh, verse 38, so it shall be on Aaron's forehead that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things which the children of Israel hallow in all their holy gifts. And that's kind of an interesting idea too. The idea here is that any gift brought by anyone before the Lord could only be brought through this imperfect channel. That all gifts that came to the Lord had to come through this channel, the priesthood and ultimately the high priest. And so Aaron, going in as the high priest, or whoever would be the high priest after that, had to bear the responsibility for the gifts that the people brought, whether they were brought or whether they were the correct gifts, brought according to God's law or w whether they were not. Now, that's kind of important because, again, here the high priest is going in and he's got to make sure that all of you 
brought the sacrifices correctly, the right sacrifices at the right time and everything was handled the right way. So the priests had a responsibility. If you brought something into the tabernacle or later into the temple that was not appropriate, the priests would have to say, nope, you can't bring that in here. Now that gave rise to some corruption later on when people would come to the temple during Jesus' time and they'd say, well, you know, I want to put a coin in the offering. They'd say, well, that's okay, but you can't put that coin in. You have to buy special temple coins, which I have available here for a small fee. <laughs> You know, so it, it turned into something that they corrupted, but the, the idea was that the high priest had to bear the responsibility of making sure that everybody's gift was right. Um, he would make sacrifices for himself before he went in, because he was only a man, right? He was just a guy, just a sinner like everybody else. According to Leviticus chapter 8 and 9, there was extensive sacrificing and washing and dressing that they would have to do as they would go in to minister to the Lord. Each article of clothing was to be worn by the high priest and his sons as they functioned as priests along with Aaron, the first high priest, ministering to the Lord and for his people. Everything was to be done exactly as God instructed them. Exactly. And if it was not, if they failed in any area, they would die. Gives you a different perspective on coming to church, doesn't it? Can you imagine sitting here on a Sunday morning singing a song and you didn't sing it real good or putting a check in the offering that you knew wasn't good? I'm just saying, you know, I'm just saying. <laughs> it, it would just give you a whole different attitude about how you come to church. But, you know, I'm wondering, though, if there, isn't there, if there isn't something in there for you and for me. You know, because coming to church and worshiping the Lord with all of you, it's a privilege. It's a privilege. Uh, and it's, a, it's not just a privilege, it's a responsibility. Uh, when we come in, you know, someone else sees me put a check in the offering box, and they say, oh, Brian Gibbs here, that's good. Uh, somebody else sees me singing a song, and they go, oh, Brian's worshiping the Lord. He's singing. Uh, you know, he's, he's at least doing it. He's at least trying. You know, he may not sing very good, but, you know, at least he's trying. Oh, I see Brian is praying. I, you know, it's not just a question of, of ministering to the Lord. It's a question of setting an example, too. And one of the things that I know I want to do for you is to set an example of what it means to come to church and to worship the Lord and to open up His Word and to worship Him together with you. And, and honestly, sometimes I think uh, I, I may not set the best example, but, you know, let me turn it around and just ask you, you know, what's the example that you set uh, when you come here? Uh, and, and I'm not putting all the responsibility upon you, but maybe the responsibility that I want you to assume for yourself is that it's a great privilege to, to come to church and, and to worship the Lord and to set an example for other believers of what it means to come to church and what it means to worship the Lord and what it means to participate in the life of God's people. Uh, just something to think about. Now, considering that all that went into dressing the priest, all these different garments, and we'll get to them again more later on. All that went into it, for glory and for beauty, as he says multiple times here, the penalty for getting it wrong was, was death. Now, where might we find someone who embodies glory and beauty without having to dress up? Well, it's got to be Jesus, doesn't it? Who embodies glory and beauty, even though he was dressed in the simplest of garments. Remember, Jesus was a manual laborer. He actually lived as a homeless guy for a number of years. He really didn't, he, people would say, where do you stand? He says, yeah, I don't have a home. i got no place to live. I'm going to wherever I lay my head. So Jesus acts as this high priest. Now, when we get into, and I, and I wish I had time to go into it because it's so rich, in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 23 to 28, Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 to 6, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 6 and 11, you should jot those down and you should read those things this evening about 
the role that Jesus plays as our high priest. Here we're reading about the high priest. We're reading about how the high priest should dress, what some of those things were supposed to symbolize, the glory and the beauty, ministering unto the Lord, representing uh, God to the people and the people to God. Read in Hebrews chapter 7, Hebrews chapter 8, Hebrews chapter 9 about the, how that is all fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus has done this for us so that we now exist on earth. God's people now exist on earth as the fulfillment of what we are called in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, a kingdom of priests. Now there's not just one priest or one tribe of people that is a priest. God says that now all of my people are priests. You ever thought of yourself as a priest? God says all of his people are saints. You ever thought of yourself as a saint? But I think one of the interesting things is that we, and I heard somebody put it like this once, and I'll leave you with this. We live the way that we live, and we do what we do not to become saints. We do what we do, and we live the way we live because we are saints. We don't live the way that we live and do what we do to become priests of God. We do what we do and live the way that we live because we are priests of God. And that's what God's Word says. Now, here's a kind of a fascinating point. That's uh, 1 Peter 2.9, uh, Revelation chapter 5, verse 10. Even John chapter 15, verse 16, you know, God chooses you and me, just like he chose Aaron for the priesthood. He chooses you. He chooses me. He chooses you to be saved. You're saved, and here you are. But let me leave you with this too. When commissioning Peter to serve as a leader in God's church, Peter was not the first pope, if you ask me, but he was commissioned as a leader in God's church in the first century. That when Jesus was commissioning him, Jesus asked him, this is John chapter 21, verses 15 to 17. Do you remember what, what Jesus asked him repeatedly? Do you love me? You notice that Jesus didn't say to him, Peter, do you love the ministry? Peter, do you, do you love serving people? Uh, because remember, Peter was, uh, he was a commercial fisherman, so he was in uh, not only manual labor, but he was also in retail also. Because you had to sell the fish, right? Now, do you think that he ever got to the end of his last nerve dealing with the general public? I guarantee you he did, because anybody that deals with the public does at some point or the other. But the point to, to, to the service was, Peter, do you love me? Because if you're going to serve anybody, you've got to love Jesus first. You've got to love Jesus first. In, in Psalm 68, verse 19, God's word says, Praise be to the Lord, to God our Savior, who daily bears our burdens. Remember, the high priest has got the names of Israel on his shoulders. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 11, I'm quoting the New International Version. It says, He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Jesus, our high priest, daily bears us on his shoulders and wears us over his heart. Let's pray. Lord, we're, we're humbled by that thought. And we're comforted and encouraged, Lord, that you care for us in that manner. And Lord, I pray that that what that would generate in our hearts is hearts of, of gratitude. That we would love you more than anyone and anything. And that that love for you would turn into ministry to others as we bear one another's burdens, as we love one another, as you would have us to love one another. Lord, we certainly need your help to do that. You've certainly made it clear in your word that we, that we must. So Lord, wherever it is that's in our hearts, where we're holding back, or where we are hesitant, or where we just don't want to do it your way. Lord, I pray that you'd cure us of that, that you'd reveal that to us, that we might repent of it and turn and go a new direction, the direction you would have us to go. So make us into those servants of yours, Lord, that, that just find it a joy to love you and to serve you, and that that would translate into love and service to each other. We need your help for that, Lord. Jesus' name. Amen.